Welcome to Total Agent Access, where we interview the most inspiring real estate agents in the world to share with you the best advice from our brightest minds. With your host, me, Colin Bredner. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we have none other than Ryan Weir out in Medicine Hat with the Atkinson team. How are you today, Ryan? Doing, doing fantastic. Happy to be here. Hopefully, we can bring some, some value to the, to the viewers and the listeners and uh, make it worth their listen for sure. So yeah, thanks, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Well, I, I definitely think that you of all people can, uh, can bring the knowledge because I certainly have uh, learned things from you. So this is great. Now, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started in real estate? Love it. Love it. So cliff notes of the last, I would say, 14, 15 years is uh, I was a golfer all my life. I went, I went, uh, got a division one college uh, scholarship to the University of Texas at San Antonio. And I just wanted to play golf. That's all I wanted to do. Uh, I got a degree in communications, which was super secondary in my mind at that time. Um, and I had a good good collegiate career, turned professional after that, and uh, chased chased the ball around around North America for for about three and a half years. Um, it took me not quite that long to figure out that I wasn't near as good as what I thought I was, um, and just decided to you know hang up the sticks and move move in a different direction. And the crazy part was I had no idea what I was going to do. And I got in touch with a, a fellow uh, with a businessman in, here in Medicine Hat, and he was actually the guy uh, that was my sponsor when I was playing. So he was the one kind of flipping the bills and supporting me because obviously it costs a lot of money to play professional golf, uh, especially at I the bet. levels that, that I was at. It's actually weird. Like the higher the level you get, the cheaper it gets and you get more money. So I was more at the at the minor leagues. And uh uh, I basically just sat down with him. I said, "Listen, you know, I, I'm done playing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not uh, finding my purpose in the game anymore." And he's like, "Well, why don't you come work for me?" And I'm like, "Okay, sounds good." Not knowing anything, so I quickly went from not caring about my degree to being uh, the director of communications for a, a, a large uh, private company here in town. So I um, kind of just stumbled into that and. It definitely served a nice, nice part part of my life for you know a couple of years there, where I just needed to get a little bit of a foundation, needed to get a little bit of an income. Uh, me and my fiance at the time then got married, and it was just a nice kind of restart. And I, I quickly found out in that couple of year period, from you know end of twenty seventeen into twenty nineteen, I'm like this nine to five grind is, is, is really tough. And, and it's not, unfortunately, it's not very lucrative. Like I, I was able to be the last in the office and first out and my boss didn't care because I was getting my stuff done. And I'm like, well, you know, this is weird because I get paid the same every month. And for a lot of people that I'm not crapping on the nine to five, it just really quickly, I found out like, Hey, this is not for me. Like I cannot foresee myself being in this fairly prestigious a uh, corporation for a long time. It just wasn't in my nature because, like I said, you know, I could go make my boss a million dollars and still get the pay, paid the same amount, or make his life way easier and get paid the same amount. And there was just something in inside me that I'm like, gosh, this is not going to get either me or my family to where I want to be. So I I started looking for other options. I'm like, well, you know, I need more income, and I think a lot of folks shy away from talking about money. Um, I actually encourage it, especially if I'm, you know, with with our team or talking with other agents. I'm like, no, like money is a big part of it. And I won't lie, that was a big factor of what got me interested in real estate. I basically had three criteria. I'm like, I need to make more money. I want to help more people because I know the money's in the people, right? And I also need to fit this in on evenings and weekends and lunch hours. So like, what are my options here? And naturally, I'm like, well, I could go maybe teach golf or something. But, you know, being in Medicine Hat, we only have about a five, six month golf season. That wasn't very appealing to me. And then uh, randomly just, you know, had lunch with a buddy of mine um, that was in real estate. Uh, I heard that he was doing well. He was from the golf world way back. That's kind of how it all started, man. I, I would love to tell you that, you know, I, I love houses. Admittedly, I don't love houses. I love helping people. And I think real estate is one of the few life hacks that we can use as a vehicle to live a bigger and better life. And I'm so grateful that I found this industry because once I got into it, 
there's so many more beautiful things about it that that I figured out along the way, and I'm like, this is this industry is amazing. So the people are amazing. Get to meet folks like you and help other folks out and grow a team and scale and leverage. Like it's it's awesome. So that's that's kind of the the quick three minute version, four minute version of, of kind of how we got here. So I got my license in 2019, and I actually I worked full time until about 20 end of 21, um, and I was just slinging deals on the side. So yeah. Excellent. What uh, what made that decision to jump right in? Well, kind of a funny story. I was the first year in, in real estate, I made more money doing transactions than I did at my nine to five job. So I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'll never forget the afternoon. My boss uh, at the nine to five, he's uh, he's a board of director on, on a fairly, fairly big communications company uh, in Canada. And uh, he had a board meeting that was through lunch. And I'm like, crap, I got a bunch of showings through lunch. And I'm like, okay. And this guy, he's old, right? But I'm like, okay, I got his his iPad. I'm like, you just need to click this link. Like, it's so easy. Just click the link and you can get on. Like, you're not going to need me. I got it set up perfectly. Like, I've tested it and tested it and tested. Just click the link and you're good to go. You'll get in. So I'm not kidding. I'm mid-showing with clients. It's like at 12, 15. Sure enough, phone phone goes off. It's my boss. He's losing his mind. Where are you? Why aren't you here? What what do I do? And I'm like, oh my gosh. I literally had to leave my showings and 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 go do this. And driving back to the office, I'm like, I'm better than this. Like, I, I love the purpose that that job served at the time, but like I want to help more people, not just one guy. And and honestly, it was it's a it, golden handcuffs as they say and and unfortunately a lot of folks in my opinion they 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 trust those golden handcuffs forever and i i just had this weird fear in my in, in, inside myself where i'm like i could stay here for 40 50 years have a notable job make a decent living and just have my life be like that and you know that was just the straw that broke the camel's back so yeah no more links helping people get on zoom calls for me <laughs> yeah it is the it is the golden handcuffs and, the, and it's honestly it's really hard uh to do really great in this industry if you aren't full-time but on the same part it's really hard to get full-time because of that uncertainty when you're a hundred percent commission sales staff it is hard to take the, the leap in you know, and I, I talk to agents all the time. And they're like, well, once I build my real estate business, up, I'll quit my other job. And you know what? I always say you're not going to be able to quit to build your uh, real estate business up mm-hmm. unless you do that. So it's having faith in yourself, I think, and, uh, you know, mentors and uh, and people around you that will tell you that way. So what is your current role right now? Okay. So. Um, and I love what you said too, Colin. It's, it's kind of a catch twenty two, right? Like yeah. I don't recommend people getting into the business like how I did because there was two years there where it'd be nothing for me to leave leave the house at seven, go to my corporate job, work uh, before before everyone else got in, just so I can leave early to go to show and not get home till eight or nine at night, right? But like that that literally got us ahead in our in our lives. Like I'm super grateful that I had the the drive to do that. And uh, wouldn't recommend it, but it, it, if you do have a part time job, it's like you you've got to burn the boats on everything else and and go all in. But uh, so so yeah, my role right now uh, got a few 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 irons in the fire. In my main job is still still transactions. Like I'm still in the trenches, uh, doing deals in Medicine Hat here and and surrounding kind of all of Southern Alberta. Um, try to do between seventy and eighty deals. Uh, a year that's kind of the sweet spot where I feel like I can do other things and, and have the flexibility and have the freedom. And like, I literally have my deal board right there. Like it never leaves. And, uh, and so um, the, the team that I joined when I started uh, my boss with the team is Courtney Atkinson. And I quickly uh, got on the leadership team there and we started building out a lot of, you know, training systems. And like, I was starting to help agents along and, and help Courtney with some of his coaching clients and we were like, well, if we're going to be doing all of these platforms, developing a boot camp program, develop, developing courses, we might as well just have a, a separate coaching company for that. 
Um, so we started Real Estate Growth Solutions, and and that was, I, I would say probably twelve to twenty hours of the week. You know, I'm helping agents grow their business. I'm helping some of Courtney's team clients popping in, maybe doing some stuff for their own agents, building out courses, and and it's kind of you know um, I would say doubling down on on what we're doing to support our Atkinson team in Southern Alberta. We can kind of just duplicate that uh, into the coaching company as well. So. But I never take my eye off of transactions. That's my golden egg. Uh, I think I think when when agents, especially individual agents, when they start getting a little little money in the bank account and they want to leverage, they actually forget about their primary source of income, which is transactions. And I think that's a cardinal sin for a lot of agents. Even if they're starting a team, they want to get out of production way too fast, and they end up. It's almost like a you know reversal of where now they're not bringing in income and they have to support more people and they almost do it the opposite way so it's a it's a very i would say important transition that way and one thing that that I want to make sure always is like hey I if I'm if I'm training an agent on how to do something I better either have done it or I will do it with them because if it doesn't work in the current market that I'm in how can I you know, believe in it and, and train it to some some other agent, right? So I think that's, you know, there's a lot of fluff in the coaching business. And there's a lot of people that um, don't don't really love the industry. And I don't blame them, right? It's the same with real estate agents. It's like, we have a stigma associated with us. And I hate that. And it's like, I want to change that and change the minds of the consumer to look at us as like people that provide service and help them through a major purchase. It's the same with the coaching company. I'm like, no, I want to actually see an agent go from 20 to 50 deals and do it with not double the amount of work. I want them to do that and grow their business and live a bigger and better life and get some time back. Like that's what gets me fired. I love that, you know, helping other people. So that's, that's the juice in life, right? Yeah. 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 And, and so, that's, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that's like one of my philosophies for my business is like, Agents think of us as like selling houses and I'm like, no, like we're in a relationship business. Like we, we grow relationships over time to earn the right to help those people through a purchase or a sale of real estate. Like that's houses are second, third to me. You know what I mean? It's like, Hey, how can I go out and build relationships with people? How can I get new relationships, grow those relationships, not expecting any of it in re- anything in return, but naturally when they do have to buy or sell or their parents have to buy or sell or someone dies or gets married, we're here with our hands up. I think that's a great way to scale. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I actually, that's really funny that you bring that up. I had that exact conversation with my team in our huddle this morning, just about doing the right thing all the time and not thinking about the money, thinking about how can I serve more people? How can I help more clients achieve what they want uh, instead of me getting paid? And that sort of thinking, that sort of mindset is a long-term business mindset instead of going deal to deal. Okay. Okay. How much am I going to get on this deal? How much am I going to get on this deal? Because you will not be in the industry very long if that's your mindset. You've got to set out, how am I going to get into this marketplace? And how am I going to serve the people in this marketplace for the next 20 years? And that is by doing the right thing all the time. I love that. I love that. And there's a, I have, I have nothing to back this on, but I, I have an inclination of this because, you know, we always see scary stats on, you know, 80% of agents don't make it to year five or whatever the case is. and Naturally, you know, when when people see those stats, they're like, well, agents run out of money or they can't handle it. And I actually think it's because those agents just get burnt out of the business. They they hate going from deal to deal chasing their tails around because they haven't built a business properly. They just go and they hunt deals, they they eat what they kill and then figure out like, oh my gosh, I need to go find another one. And that's where they focus on the transaction as opposed to like a relationship building business. And again, I have no stats to support that, but the agents that I see burn out at years three, four, and five, it's not because they can't find any deals. It's because the, the industry drives them. They don't, they don't work their business. I, I think you are a hundred percent right on that because yeah. it is exhausting. If all you're doing is waking up in the morning, going out there and having to find and you're only doing that because you haven't set it up. I hate those relationships in front already and waiting for, for the goodwill to come back to you. 
And that's a terrible, and I agree, you know, like that is just a recipe for burning out. And that's the point. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about lead generation and marketing. So what are, mm. you know, like 70 to 80 homes per year? That's a really, really good number. And you and I are both from small cities and I can understand that amount of volume. Whereas if you're in a big city and you do 70, 80, whoo, boy. That's uh, that's a really good living, but we need to in smaller towns. We need to do more deals or relationships. So, what are your top three strategies for generating? Mm, I love that. So, <clears throat> this this has changed in the last few years for me, uh, but I was proactive with it. Um, and again, back to kind of business building, I knew that within the first three years of me having my real estate license, I'm like, my sphere's not going to trust me enough. I might get a few pity deals from family and friends, but they may still be hesitant to use me because they don't know me as a competent agent. So like if I'm thinking, and this is a good way for our viewers to think about your business is like, I think of it as silos of revenue. Okay. Like where are my deals coming from? I can't really pinpoint when a deal is going to drop from each silo. I can just work my silos religiously and trust that there's going to be deals dropping from them. So a big silo for me in my first even four years of having my license was just simple PPC leads that were generated through the team. So simple website with good organic reach. We would even just do a PPC on, on Google, Bing, and Yahoo. We would get a lead that surfs the website prompts them to contact, uh, put their contact information in. That then gets dropped to me. And I would churn out anywhere between about 25 to 35 deals annually from those leads. And I would get a couple leads a day. So our lead volume was really good. Like we have, we have a lead issue on our team because we have too many leads, right? Um, which is a great place for a new agent to go because, I mean, you very good problem to have. Great problem. I yeah. also have that same problem on my team and trying to find people who uh, who want to come and work for us. That's also an yeah, know, issue that I keep on trying to get. I got too many leads. What do you want to do? Yeah. And a lot of agents will think, ah, oh, those are low quality leads. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of, you know, agents, not only myself, but on our team that have been starting out that have been crushing it. And again, you know, if you have sales breath and you're like, hey, I need to make this dial because I need to sell this person a house this year. Well, that's not going to work, right? So like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to have good scripts, but I'm in my back of my mind, I'm going to dial and be like, Hey, how can I help this person when the time is right for them? And I'm going to ask about their timeline, right? I'm going to dive deep into why they actually registered for the home search website. There is some intent there for sure. There is. So I need to figure that out. Right. And I need to come from a level of service knowing like, Hey, if it's not meant to be for them, this year, next year, or the year after, well, maybe there's some way I can stay in touch with these people over time, right? So I would say, to answer your question, the biggest lead source for me over the first three years of being licensed, for sure, those PPC leads, right? The unpaid part, and I, I kind of screwed this up in my first few years, I would get the odd deal through social media just from posting about, you know, solds and, you know, new listings and look at me, I'm an agent, which makes me sick nowadays, because I, I don't do any of that anymore. And I've gotten way more results, we can get into that a little bit later. Um, but then uh, first few years, it was hunting business, like hunting in terms of open housing, hunting in terms of like any realtor.ca leads from uh, our office, I would get on right away. I latched myself onto our top producer and like, hey, how can I make your life easier? Knowing that when he's busy, he's going to send those leads to me. Um, and anyone that's on a team, that's one of the best things and first things you need to do if you're a younger agent is like, who's a top producer? How can you help them for free for three months? Because I guarantee you it's going to pay you back in dividends like you would never imagine, right? And a lot of times those high producing agents, they won't work those low hanging fruit leads like they should. And they're actually losing out on business, right? So um, those would be, those would kind of be the lead sources that, that, that I started out with that really made uh, the foundation of my business good for years four, five, and six. And what I did at the start, which I'm so grateful for, is every single deal that I did, and this sounds silly, and it sounds like, yeah, obviously you need to do this, but I just have a, a separate CRM just for past clients, and I simply rank them from one to five. 
And one is like, you know, maybe it was a foreclosure and like maybe a person wasn't even involved kind of thing. There's no one really there. But as you start working up two, three, four, and five, I do different things for each rating. Whereas my four and five stars, I'm rolling out the white carpet, you know, red carpet service for these people. Like if I see a five star out for dinner, I'm picking up their tab. No, no question about it. They know that they're a five-star client of mine. I'm popping by their house three times a year just with a gift card, with a coffee. I know their favorite drinks. I know their kids' names. I know everything about them because they've essentially given me business and I want to give it back into that relationship, right? So every year as my past client list is growing, I'll adjust people up and down the rankings to where I'll have about 20 people in my five star, 40 people in my four star, 100 people in my three star. And so everything's always churning out. And my repeat and referral this last two years have been incredible. Insane. How much business I've strummed up from that. So if you're listening right now, back it up, back this podcast up, write down what Ryan just said implement it execute on that have the past client database rank them best clients get that vip treatment that is how you build an actual business instead of going transaction to transaction and say enough what you just gave like we could end this podcast right now and it would be so valuable to everyone you need to do what Ryan just said. You touched on it a little bit uh, back about you've stopped doing just list. You just sold because they make you sick. Talk to me. What are you doing online right now? Love it. Okay. And I'll add one other thing before we go to social. Um, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm talking about past client list, but think about this too, is like who in your community that you know could send you business? Why are they not a four or a five star? Like just just give them value. Be front of mind for them. I have this one gal in town. She's an appraiser. Does a lot of commercial appraisals. She sends me so much business. I've never done a transaction with her before, but I'm like she's a referral source for me. So she, I treat her like the highest of five star past clients. Yeah, right. You don't so, need to transact to be a five yeah. star client. Exactly. You exactly. don't need to. Yeah, yeah. These are so, all silos that you can have to get you business even though you haven't transacted with five star absolutely mm-hmm. you pick out the tab at the pub right yep exactly exactly so over to over to social which has been awesome for me lately and and i recognize like i was born and raised in in the community that i serve so naturally i i know a lot of people right um and what what i found was i was the first three three and a half years of being in the business I was doing everything that I thought an agent should, okay? And it was like a light bulb moment when I started looking at stats of like, that 80% of agents don't make it to year five, 75% of agents, whatever that is for, uh, you know, you can Google it, you're going to find crazy stats. And I was like, well, if 80% of agents don't make it, why am I doing everything like every other agent? Like that makes, that actually makes no sense, right? So I started following a bunch of agents in my market and I was just doing what they were doing. So open houses, you know, just sold. Hey, I sold this house in three minutes over asking price. I'm the best. Look at this possession, you know, fourth possession. Looking back, like when I see my my memories, it just makes me sick to my stomach, right? Honestly, it does because people do not see value in that. Like your your aunt that lives in the East Coast might like it. My mom's going to like it. And maybe the the client's going to like it. Now, I'm not saying don't have like a team page for listings because there's some seller demand for that stuff. No, no doubt, no doubt about that. But I do not have a prof- um, I have a I have a personal professional page on Facebook. That's it. And all I want to do is be front of mind for my audience and give them content that they like. Period. Like I think of myself as someone standing in the middle of an arena and my stadium is full of my audience on social media. And I have the opportunity to post things out into that stadium. And I want there to be some stickiness to that. So yeah, I might post random real estate stuff once in a while. But if I look at how many of my posts have been hitting, a lot of times they have nothing to do about real estate. They have to do with lifestyle. They have to do with golf because I'm into golf and it motivates me to be a a better person. 
I talk about scaling businesses. A lot of people like that. I talk about how I'm using real estate to live a bigger and better life. I'm talking about health and fitness. I'm talking about things that people actually will be attracted to and read. I'm sorry. Like, it's not awesome to sell a house in a day. Like, it, you might feel like it is and you might feel good posting about it. But is that really getting you reach and getting you traction on social? And the answer is just no, it's not. Like, so why are we doing these things? So I always look at like, hey, if there's, if there's massive statistics of failure, how can I be different than that? And how can I do it with where I feel comfortable doing these things? Like, I'm getting more referrals and business from DMs now than ever before, just because I'm interacting with people more online. And yeah, the more people that you interact with, well, they might have to buy and sell a house this year. And they're naturally going to reach out to you because there's some level of relationship there. It's not zero out of 10, right? They're like, oh yeah, Ryan's an agent. I've seen a few of his posts about the market, educating them on it. Well, let's reach out to him, right? So there's a little bit of method in the madness there. I do two videos per month um, where I'm talking maybe real estate specific, but I always come from an educational standpoint. Like, hey, if you're a citizen in Medicine Hat, this is what your own value is likely doing because of X, Y, and Z. There's no call to action. There's nothing. I boost it for 45 bucks. So I have essentially two posts running all the time, right? So I'll do a post on the first of the month. 15th of the month, boost each of them 45 bucks each. So I always have a churn and I just do it right around my city, whatever it is, like a three mile radius. And that's it, man. I keep it super simple. I keep it fun. And I find like I'm getting more results from it. So I'll just keep doing that. Right. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, uh, it pays to be a thumb at a finger party, right? There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what advice would you give a brand new agent uh, who's struggling with? generating leads generating leads i would say and you don't have to be on a team for this but i kind of mentioned it earlier like if you're at a bigger brokerage i would latch on to a high producer and i would offer up to do open houses for them that, that's the first thing i would do i would set aside some time to literally write down silos of, of potential revenues so or silos of deal deals like hey where could i get a deal from well there's hunting business, which is more like open houses, in my opinion, right? There maybe is more of like farming business of like, hey, how can I pick an area of town to where I can go door knock four times a year and grow relationships with those people? Oh, by the way, you probably live in a neighborhood, so maybe start there <laughs> and just start providing value to people over and over and over and over. I pick a neighborhood where I live. There's 200 houses. I'm doing things for them four times a year. Sometimes I pay a kid to go drop flyers off, right? Sometimes I'm popping by. Sometimes I'm, you know, out just doing things and, and talking to my neighbors, right? Sometimes I'm dropping off uh, Easter cookies on Easter weekend. I'm just nurturing that specific neighborhood over and over. So that's farming, right? There would be what I would call sphere of influence. So the people that already know you, like you, and trust you, how are you working that silo of business? There's referrals, which is a lot different than SOI, in my opinion, right? So I would say it's different for every agent, but like create a business plan. Like be like, hey, where could I potentially get deals from? Okay. Networking is another big one as my mind's churning right now. Like who do I know in town that knows a lot of people? Well, maybe there's a good place to start. So I would just simply start with your silos and then be like, what can I do every week to touch each of these silos? And just slowly shuffle them along to where there's going to be a better chance that you're going to be churning out deals from those silos. Because again, you can't really control exactly when a deal is going to drop from one of those things, in my opinion, anyways. So the more consistent action that we can put forth to working those silos, the better. And each one of them is going to require a game plan. That's where, in my opinion, when an agent just has a white space on his calendar, I'm like, we need to start building out and treating this like a business. And that's a great place to start because those silos for specific agents may be a little bit bigger for someone else that is from this community as opposed to someone that just moved here. Well, we may need to take a little bit different approach with that agent. Now, you touched on it a little bit about uh, joining a team. So many new agents that I know that come into the business, they want to do everything. They want to be the boss, you know, finally, where I'm in business for myself. What made you join a team? 
And secondly, if you're selling 70 to 80 houses, why are you staying with the team? I love that. So what made me join the team was I couldn't tell you the difference between a bungalow and a two-story when I started. Um, And I knew based off of, because I sat down with other brokerages, and I just looked at the team model, and I wasn't scared about commission splits. Okay, I think commission splits have a bad name to them in this industry because agents don't understand the value in doing things that you aren't good at. I'll say that again. Agents don't understand the value in not doing things that you are not good at. So remember, I had to sling deals on evenings and weekends. So I'm like, okay, the quicker I can leverage out of doing all these hundred things that agents tell me they do, the the better. And oh, by the way, here's a team. Well, let's do that. That was literally my thought process. I'm like, this team concept, not knowing much about it, I'm like, I don't have to do all of these things. They're giving me leads. And that can actually work with the time that I have uh, uh, available to put towards this industry. So I saw it as like a scalable thing, like a scale in a box plan. So I'm like, well, let's start there. And I think for any new agent, either it's a team or you need to latch on to like a high producer and almost work like a team uh, with that person. Um, And in our market, in Medicine Hat, Teams have terrible raps. Like people don't understand why someone will go to a team and pay a 50% split. And I'm like, well, 100% of zero deals is $0. So like there's that concept too, right? And so to answer the second point, why am I still on a team? Um, admittedly, there's, there's, there's something inside me that wants to see our team succeed just because of all the, all, not the hate that we have in town, but just like all the bad talking of agents being like, oh, you know, teams don't work. They're not scalable. They don't pay their agents enough. And so there's a little bit of that to it. But my goal for every single year moving forward is how can I do the same amount of deals with less time? And I've been behind the curtains of dozens of teams and they aren't as profitable as agents think they are. And for being an agent, I'm like, I don't want to go start a team to leverage, nor do I want to be a solo agent and make more money per deal, but have to do 900 things. Like, am I really serving my client if I'm the one doing the measurements? Am I really serving my client if I'm the one going pounding in signs and lock boxes? Like, the, the, the answer is no. My value to my client is helping them through a journey of buying or selling a property that makes it as smooth as possible for them to do so. And what agents don't understand is sometimes the less you're involved, the more smooth it is. Like this whole world, Colin, has moved towards convenience. So every time I meet someone, I'm like, what does convenience look like for these people? How can I provide this most convenient transaction for them? And if I just take my ego out of it, I'm like, well, in a lot of these steps, I'm actually not there. I'm not involved, right? The team is the one that should be supporting these people more than me, right? So I think it's just that mindset of like, hey, I know the value of my time. And I also know the things that I'm not good at. All the hundred hats that agents wear, I did not get into this business to do all of those things. I I got into the business to help people. And I think a lot of agents lose that. And every time I run the numbers, by the way, I'm way more ahead on a team because I have no risk. I have no very small out-of-pocket costs monthly. And I'm like, hey, if I ever feel slow, I just click leads on and I can start making dials. So it's kind of cool that way, I think. Yeah, that's great. You know, leveraging yourself out of many of those hats, I think, is key. And the self-awareness that you talked about. Okay, I'm not good at these things. And trying to bang your head against the wall and be good at the things that you're not good at, that can lead to burnout as well. Mm-hmm. There, you know? there, there's, in my opinion, again, tough to really track this, but I think, I think those things that you're not good at have, have two levels of irritation to it. Number one, it's doing those things, like the time allotted to do that, that specific task. But for me, when I have to do those things, I get burnt out even after that because I'm kind of pissed off that I had to go spend time doing that, right? So I think of 
you know, agents think, okay, I need to scale and do more business. But with that comes more work. What I want to look at agents when I when they're talking about their business is like, how can we get you either to do the same amount of business with way less time or do marginally more business with way less time? Because now you have time in your corner. And from my experience going through this industry for the last six years, I'm like, just let me figure out how to do 70 to 80 deals with as little time as possible. And that's what excites me. I'm not saying I'm slacking off and giving my clients a bad experience. I'm guiding through this journey with the lens of convenience, right? It's the same con- concept as like Netflix and Blockbuster. Like I thought growing up, the only way to get a video game is to drive all the way across town, right? Probably pay a late fee because I haven't delivered my last one on time. You know, hopefully one's in stock, right? Like it's so barbaric to think that we did that back in the day. Now there's other options. So like, I think real estate has been stuck in like this old way of doing things and agents that come into the business just do things because they've just been done that way forever. And I'm like, well, no, it doesn't need to be that way, right? Why don't we try different things? And the beauty of this calling is every time I've tried to leverage out of something, once I do it, like there's fear involved with that, right? Like a showing partner model, for example. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy. What are clients going to think? Like, you know, this is going to be, you know, really weird to get through. And then I get on the other side of it. And I'm like, I should have done this two years ago. Like, why did I, every single time I try things and get to the other side of that, I'm like, oh, well, what? That was easy. Like, why don't we do that more? Like, let's just yeah, keep doing I, that. I always think if there's some fear in it or it makes you nervous, you probably should try it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, yeah. and that's one of our, our core, core values of our team is to always be in beta, always be trying, always be learning, always, you know, our systems are not written on stone tablets. We can rewrite them. We can, we can break them and build them back up again. And having that as a core value really drives us to innovate. And the innovation is all based around being a client. Mm. I love that. And, and not only, I like how you put it being in beta, but like, I always think like, be curious because we're in a fluid industry. Like the market's changing, right? We, when I started in 2018, 2019, we were in a heavy buyer's market, right? And in somewhat of a short amount of time, four years, boom, it totally flipped. So like the toolkit that we wear needs to change. It always needs to be evolving. And I always want to have some hindsight and, and some reflection, not a ton, but being like, hey, okay, I know I need a past client list, but what if I actually treated each relationship a little bit different? And just ask myself, well, okay, well, what if we rank them in order of how I think I'm going to get future business from? Well, that makes sense to me, right? Like, hey, I, I feel overwhelmed because I got a bunch of showings on the books. I'm working with a bunch of buyers. Inventory is really low, so we got to get to places right away. I can't be two places at once. Why don't Why don't I try a showing partner model? Worst case, I get fired. Oh well, big deal. We can move on. Let's try it. Oh my gosh, my clients really love that. Let's just keep duplicating it. So I think it's where business is going is is more found within the questions we ask ourselves and just looking at this as a craft, not as like a job that we do to sell houses. I think of this business and my my own real estate transactions as a craft. I'm like, hey, can I do different things here? Can I actually scale out of this thing that I don't really love doing? Can I make more money with less time this year? What would that look like? So that's the part, Colin, that I love about this business because it's ever-changing and people do things so differently sometimes. And I'm like, that's kind of unique. Why don't we try that, right? So, Yeah, and that's good. And, you know, always being in beta and learning new things sort of leads us to trying new tools and technology, what do you use on a daily basis uh, to run your business? And are there any new tools that have just come into your sphere in the last little while? I love that. So it's not going to be as fancy as probably viewers want it to be. Um, we do use a CRM religiously, which is good. I have my assistant help me with that, with a lot of the stuff. Um, I use what CRM a, a, do you use? A Sierra Interactive. Um, is the one that we use. Uh, 
I love it from a from a team leader and coach standpoint because it records the calls. Uh, so it gives us a great learning opportunity when an agent might be struggling, right? Um, because we're not there with all agents all the time listening to calls. So it's great if an agent can come and be like, hey, I really screwed this call up. Where did it go wrong? So we can listen to it. I mean, all CRMs are are great. Whatever one that you use and know well, it's the best CRM for you. I use Constant Contact uh, for my past client and Sphere emails. So again, that's the two emails a month or two videos a month that I'll send out to, through constant contact and then use that social post as well. It's the same video. It's the same, um, it's the same, you know, uh, verbiage on there and everything like that. So that's a, that's a software tool I use. I use Descript to get the subtitles on there to edit videos. Um, and then uh, the only other thing uh, that I, that I use, man, to be honest, is my laptop, my Mac computer. Like again, I've scaled back my tech use a ton in the last few years. A ton because I used to be like, hey, I got to be in my CRM two hours a day. I got to get through all the pawn leads. I got to try to churn out business. Colin, this year, I'm going to hit easy 70 deals making zero dollars in my CRM. Zero. And I do not recommend that for agents, but it's a test for me this year to be like, okay, Ryan, have you built your business as good as you think you have? Let's remove that silo. And oh, by the way, I just got about three hours a day back. And I'm on track. So that's something where I don't want a new agent to take that as the gospel. But it's like, hey, you better be thinking about your future business in years five, six, seven, eight. And what are you doing in years one, two, and three to help build you to that point? I always call that like our future self. Like, are you doing the things this week, this month, this year that has you on track to being either a better person, a higher producer, more leverage? Right, because I think we get in this mundane, dogmatic kind of mind where it's like month after month after month. All of a sudden, we look up, the year's over, and we haven't built anything. We've just done deals. So that's one of the big things this year that I've let go of that has really challenged me. Because I'm like, gosh, that makes me nervous to think like, hey, I'm not going to have that silo of revenue. But I built that up to a point where I'm I'm okay giving that up and just seeing what happens. Worst case, I don't do it next year. Right? Yeah. That's, that's actually really good. You know, like if you're not phoning into your, uh, database, it's because you've done the work ahead of time, right? You can't just start a business. Oh, I'm going to start as an agent. I'm not going to phone anybody. It is not going to work. So if you're listening to this and you think that Ryan has got the, got the magic here, it's only because he's worked his butt off for five years to set himself up. Yeah. And it's not like you aren't communicating with people you still are you have to but you're just not owning those phoning them, those yeah. leads and, and getting them to the place yeah, those, you know over those PPC time, right? Leads, right? Yeah. yeah yeah you got to start somewhere right so you know you're really big on learning and growing how do you continue to do that as a real estate agent i think i think it it starts with uh, proactive thought and, and this is something i work with agents a lot of of too is like literally setting some time aside to where you you think about and daydream a little bit about like what what your life what you want your life to look like one three five years down the road you can go further out than that if you want but you know how it is life always changes but i i don't think as agents we we do we do enough of that because what I want to, like, I'm 32 now, by, by the time I'm 40, like, I, I want to be done or have the ability to be like, hey, I have enough passive revenue through rev share, through rental properties that me and my wife and our kid, we can do whatever we want and be totally comfortable. And I can give that golden egg up fine. Right. So like, I know that that's my goal at 40. And then I just basically back it up year after year after year and be like, okay, well, how can I make sure that this year I either build something or give something up to where I'm on track for that, right? And I don't think agents proactively think about what they want their life or their business to live like. And I never tell people that, hey, you can totally separate your life and real estate apart. It's always intertwined to some extent. And I like to think about real estate as like, hey, how can I use real estate? How can I use this beautiful industry to help me get to my future self? Whether that's the end of this year, the end of 2026, the end of whenever I turn 40. Like, how can I use this vehicle, this business? How can I use that most effectively to get me there? And I think that's 
that's a good place to start is like, if, for example, I'm working with an Asian, I'm like, well, New Year's Eve this year, what are you celebrating? Right. And then you can back that up. Maybe they want to make 50 grand. Maybe they want to make a hundred grand. Right. So I'm big into goal setting my myself personally, because that gives me at least some type of benchmark to figure out like, yes, I did that check mark. Fantastic. Let's move on. Let's continue to ask ourselves good questions. So I don't know if that answers exactly your question, Colin, but I, I don't I don't think there's enough proactive thought. I think the majority of agents, they just go about their days, they go about their years, they don't even know how many deals they're at. And at the end of four years, they're like, ah, oh, the market's bad. I, I'm going to go work at a dental office or something, right? And I'm like, gosh, like if you just thought about things a little bit differently, if you just ran towards those uncomfortable things, if you just looked at your business as something that could really elevate your life, it could have been different. And by that point, it's way too late to fix those agents because they're so ingrained in the way that they think things should be. Yeah. Um, we, we just did, our team just did some uh, goal settings for the second half of 2024. Now, how do you go about setting goals for yourself so that they're not, you know, we had some sort of discussion about setting achievable goals or setting really big goals that if you don't hit, at least you fail really high. And that's my school of thought. I like to set my goals really big so that if I don't achieve them, I fail really high as opposed to going, yeah, I can do that. I'm going to set that as well. Yeah, no, I, I like that. So there's, there's a few questions I ask myself. And th this doesn't happen Jan 1, by the way. Like this, this happens October, November, because we live in a delayed gratification business. So like our October, November efforts are bleeding into 2025, right? Like we don't have six months left of this year. We have like four, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, side tangent there. Um, but I'll ask myself, how much money do I want to make the year following, right? And then I'll break that out. Where do I want that income to come from? So I'll, that will set my transaction goal. And then the other question that I'm going to ask myself is when people buy or sell real estate with me, what is my ideal Google review? I think that's a good question for agents to really think about and not like fire at the hip with an answer, but be like, hey, what's the experience that I want to give to my clients this year? Can you keep that short and concise, a one or two sentence thing to where if someone did leave you a Google review, what would it say, right? And I think when you frame it that way, that's my foundation for everything that I either do or don't do in my business. Because my ideal Google review for my clients is, thank you so much, Ryan, you made that so easy. Period. That's it. Right? It's a, a review I never asked for. And it's, thank you so much, that was so easy. Like that is the holy grail for me. So everything that I think about, every single piece of AI that comes up on my Facebook, every single thing that people try to sell me or tell me to do, I'm like, does this actually get me closer to that Google review that I want for my clients? Usually the answer is no. And I think about as my career progresses, how many more things can I let go of to leverage my time to, for me to do the things that I really want to do and I'm good at? Because like there's this scaling misconception of like I need to be doing more, 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 and more. You're going to hit a ceiling, right? It's like, no, what can you let go of? Sometimes, and outside of, of real estate, sometimes that's habits. Sometimes that's nutritional things. Sometimes that's alcohol you have to give up. Some, to me, it's a lot easier to give stuff up to get me closer to that future self that I want. What habits or routines have contributed most to your success? Quite, quite honestly, Colin, like now having, having a kid, we got an eight month old at home. The fitness routine has, has definitely fallen off a little bit, but I, I'm okay with that. Totally fine with that. This is where uh, I'm, I'm still quite active in, in competing in, in golf tournaments. That is my purpose. And that's, that's my vehicle to competition. And what really gets me going, Colin, is like being able to basically shut my business, not shut my business down, but be able to be super flexible in the summertime. 
to where I can go compete in golf tournaments, still show up for my family. I'm still there for my clients, but I'm not really grinding and getting new business. I'm just kind of in the stalemate for a while and, and be okay with that because a lot of agents can say that they're not doing much, but they have this like uneasy panic feeling. And I want to be able to be in a place to where I've built my business up enough throughout the year to where I'm legitimately okay with being slower for a few months because I plan for it. Right. So I'm very, very much so a person in habit of getting to the gym in the morning before work, going to the office, right, being around real estate people. And literally, like if you come to our office in Medicine Hat, after our 9 a.m. huddle, everyone goes and makes calls. Like there's not a lot of water cooler talk. And I think that doing those things in the morning, and I'm sure everyone's heard this a million times, but it's like, are you actually holding yourself accountable to those revenue producing activities early in the morning before the day kind of gets away from you? And agents will say that they'll go to the office, they'll look busy, right? But they'll only make like a few dials. So if you're a new agent, it's like, hey, you got to make 100 dials a day or set one appointment before you go home. Like that's a non-negotiable in my opinion, non-negotiable. And I always think of it too, Colin, this is kind of a side tangent, but knowing what this industry has given me and knowing where like this other Ryan Weary would have been, that fuels me too. Because the alternative of not finding this industry and not giving it my all isn't that great. Like it's literally a corporate job making an eighth of what I make now and being unhappy. Like I know that's the alternative. I'm never going back there. So if my tough work for this day is making a hundred dials or reaching out to my past clients or getting uncomfortable and doing a video. If that's my quote, hard work, I'm all for it. And as a new agent, if your hard work is making a hundred dials, that's nothing. Like go, go do snow removal in the winter. That's hard work because that's likely an alternative for a lot of agents. So like I look at it, maybe at a little bit of a contrarian view, but that motivates me too. Yeah. Getting to the end here, but what yep. personal qualities do you think are essential for success in real estate? Mm, I love that. So first and foremost, you have to be personable. You do not need to know anything about real estate, in my opinion, when you get into the business, but you have to have to be personable. And this is just from calling growing our team and helping other other people grow teams. And I don't know if there is a perfect answer, but the two traits are personable. And I need to sense a little bit of a grind personality feature from those people. Like a little bit of like, hey, I'm going to get this, right? Because I think if if you don't have that little bit of grind in you, then you're not going to be able to get uncomfortable and do the things that you need to be doing to get over that hump of being a new agent. We have this one guy on our team, Colin, like we were on the fence of if he should or shouldn't be, if he's going to be a cultural fit for us. And he's an older guy. I uh, worked at the city forever and like we were almost not going to bring him on and we brought him on and it turns out he grinds like no one else. He knows a ton of people and he's gotten that flavor of what this industry can lend him to and he is crushing it. But he can go up to a stranger, talk to them and then go do the work on the evenings and weekends if he has to. Like if you don't have that grind, I just don't think you can make it. Like you can be as personal and as nice and have decent work ethic, but if you don't have that grind to you, and, and that's a that's a really tough quality to sense early on, but I don't know if that's that's a tangible thing you can really sense until you get to know someone. But I think those are the two massive things. Yeah, and grit mm -hmm. is yep. what I call it. You got to have yep. grit. You have to have that determination in you to never fail. Failure isn't an option, so there's only winning that's left. So before we wrap this up, thank you very, very much, man. You just yeah. spit fire for an hour, which was really great. If anybody wants to get a hold of you, because we love to give referrals off this yes. podcast, what is the best way if somebody's got a client coming into uh, Medicine Hat? Uh, direct sales 403-548-0813 or just on Facebook, Instagram, just Ryan Weary. You'll find me. And uh, yeah, any any business would be much appreciated. But at, at the the very least, hopefully someone took one or two good nuggets out of here. And, and um, you know, I'll finish with this too, because I had a few things written down just as what sure. I wanted to get across. Because like ideas are always kind of rolling in my mind too. And I, I, 
this is maybe not fully articulated yet, but I think in this business, we, we operate like in, in somewhat of like what I would call, we don't see the lost opportunity that we may have gotten, right? Like a lot of newer agents, they'll call someone or they'll meet them at the open house. And I'm like, well, I wish that person that goes and buys a house with someone else would knock on that agent's door and go burn $5,000 in front of them, right? We don't we don't sense the loss in this business enough, and I wish we would have. And I, I would encourage agents to think about that. Like, how many people are you in contact with on a daily basis that end up buying a house sometime in the future, and no one comes and kicks you in the shin because of it? But what if you knew they were going to buy two, three, four, five years in the future? How would you act in that moment? And I think that's where some awareness of the unforeseen lost opportunity, if you can just be aware of that, will change how agents either talk on the phone or communicate with people in their community to be like, hey, I need to make sure that my relationship is to a point with these people that if they do transact real estate, I'm already going to be ahead of them. Love that. Love that. Thanks for sharing that final thought with us. And okay. thank you very Thanks, much Colin. Appreciate again it. for being on the podcast. And I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll talk real soon. All right. Take care, Ryan. Thank you so much for listening to Total Agent Access. Head on over to iTunes, hit subscribe. While you're there, leave us a review. One star is okay, but five stars is even better.